the aims of the League of Nations were firstly to discourage aggression from any nation secondly to encourage countries to communicate in business and trade thirdly to encourage nations to disarm next to improve living and working conditions all over the world essentially the League was set up to keep world peace the League's organization and why it was weak the League of Nations had many governing bodies within it but we are going to focus on just three firstly the council was a small group which met five times a year the council's main purpose was to resolve disputes that arose between its member nations through discussion however the council had one main shortfall each member had a veto which meant that just one member could stop the council acting even if all of the members agreed therefore it was very difficult for the council to make decisions secondly the assembly was like the league's parliament every country in the league sent a representative that could vote on admitting new members to the league and on ideas put forward by the council however the assembly's main shortfall was that it only met once a year so it took a long time for matters to be resolved also like the council all decisions had to be unanimous thirdly the permanent court of justice was also responsible for settling disputes between countries peacefully and made decisions on border disputes however the court's main problem was that it had no way of making sure that countries followed its rulings successes and failures of the 1920s one of the main aims of the League of Nations was to resolve border disputes and in the 1920s they had a mixture of success and failure to deal with the positives first the League successfully dealt with the problem of Upper Silesia in 1921 both Germany and Poland wanted control over it and the League decided to allow the people of Silesia to choose which country they liked to join and divide the region accordingly another success came with the island islands in 1921 Sweden and Finland were both threatening to fight for them and the League studied the matter carefully before stating that the islands should go to Finland Sweden accepted the ruling and war was avoided however the League failed to resolve other disputes successfully in 1920 Poland took control of the Lithuanian capital of Vilna and Lithuania appealed for help the League could only protest to Poland because they did not have Britain and France's wholehearted support in the end Poland kept Vilna secondly the League failed over an incident surrounding Corfu in 1923 Mussolini bombarded the island in response to the murder of the Italian general Tellini in Greece the League condemned Mussolini's actions and proposed that Greece should pay compensation to the League who would give this to Italy only if Tallini's murderers were found. However, the League's defiance cracked as Mussolini persuaded it to force Greece to apologise and pay direct compensation to Italy. How the depression made the league's work more difficult in 1929 economic disaster struck as the wall street crash started a long depression throughout the world this affected relations between countries and most goodwill and optimism evaporated for example britain and the usa were reluctant to help sort out international disputes while its own economies were suffering secondly in germany the Nazis wanted to take advantage of the chaos by planning to overturn the Treaty of Versailles. Thirdly, France built frontier defences on its border with Germany. And finally, Italy and Mussolini wanted to disguise their economic problems by trying to build an overseas empire. The League's failures in the 1930s when Japan invaded the Chinese area of Manchuria in 1931 and 1932 the League of Nations was brought under close scrutiny 
and it is safe to say that it failed miserably to deal with the crisis. It took weeks for the league's officials to sail around the world to assess the situation and only in September 1932 did they produce a Lytton report, one year after the invasion began. Japan did not take the league seriously and even planned to invade more of China, arguing that they were trying to defend their own interests. Economic sanctions would not work because Japan's main trading partner was the USA, which was not a member of the league. Amazingly, it even appeared that Britain was more interested in keeping good relations with Japan and were not prepared to fight for faraway land. The League also would not consider banning arms sales to Japan as they feared retaliation and war. Overall, Japan had committed blatant aggression and the League appeared to be powerless. The second major talking point in the 1930s was the Abyssinian Crisis, which proved to be a fatal blow to the League of Nations. Like Japan, Italy also wanted to expand its empire and they invaded Abyssinia in 1935. The League failed over this incident for a number of reasons. Firstly, it can be suggested that Britain and France would turn a blind eye to Mussolini's invasion if he maintained the Stresa Pact, which was a deal to unite against German rearmament. Secondly, the League delayed their decision to impose oil sanctions, allowing Mussolini to stockpile his raw materials. Thirdly, Britain and France did not close the Suez Canal, which provided Mussolini's ships with direct access to Abyssinia. They feared that Mussolini would retaliate and begin war. Furthermore, the British and French foreign ministers, Hore and Laval, hatched a secret plan to give Mussolini two-thirds of Abyssinia if he called off the invasion. This was seen as a blatant act of treachery and lack of support for the League. Finally, America continued to support Italy with oil, which was central to their war effort, and by May 1936, the League could only watch helplessly as Italy took control over the whole country. In summary, collective security had been shown up as an empty promise. The League did have some success in the 1920s, but this was largely overshadowed by its spectacular failures over Manchuria and Abyssinia.